Again, let me just thank everybody for being here this morning. Thankful for the presence of each and every one. Uh, if you're not aware, we do have a handful or so that are in the fellowship building, else the number in here would look even, even uh, more full. But uh, we're thankful uh, that everybody's at least able to uh, be here, and I think they may be just on a, a slight delay, uh, but uh, we've got uh, the, the TV is set up, and the YouTube is, is up and running there, and, and for those that uh, didn't feel comfortable or needed to perhaps to uh, be a little more cautious, and so we're thankful for, for, for the folks up there and the folks down here as well. Let me also just remind you that when we, uh, uh, or when the determination was made to resume uh, our assemblies, uh, it was a Sunday morning only assembly uh, through today. And that an evaluation and determination would be made after this morning's uh, service. And uh, I've talked with, with several. I've talked with Ryan and Rhonda and, 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 and Philip and others. Uh, but uh, the elders uh, would probably like some feedback on, on uh, your thoughts about going forward uh, next Lord's Day morning. And, um, and so whatever, the, whatever those are, uh, just be mindful that we probably are not all of the same mindset. And so you offer up, you know, offer up your your, your thoughts and, and uh, to the elders, and then let them uh, weigh those things, and then whatever determination is made, uh, whether we get our way or not, we're going to go with our what our elders tell us, and uh, we're not going to grumble, and we're going to keep moving forward, and uh, and eventually we, I'll tell you, I will tell you this, eventually we will get back where we were. And I think probably uh, sooner rather than later, depending on what sooner means and later means. But we're going to get back. But uh, let uh, let Lynn and Walter know your thoughts uh, this morning uh, before you leave, and, and so that they can get a feel for the congregation. And and uh, that's what leadership is all about. It's not just making dictator type decisions and just saying this is the way it's going to be. And uh, I've appreciated that out of the eldership. For a long, long time, not just these two men, but Wade and, and uh, B.A., uh, always willing to, to listen to the folks and, and, uh, and make those decisions uh, based on uh, uh, their wisdom and, and the desires of the local congregation. So I'm thankful for that. Now uh, turn your uh, Bibles to the book of John. Now, you probably got a double-sided handout this morning, and the reason for that is I hate waste, and I messed up. I messed up a print. Actually, what happened is last week I printed a handout and forgot to get it out of the copier. So when I got here this morning to make copies, all the copies from last week were still in the copy. So I put them back in upside down so that they could print on the other side. But then I messed up some of those, and then I ran some others that got messed up. So there's, a, there's about 100 sheets of paper that only have one blank side on them. And I'm trying to... Well, let me just tell you this. By the time I got done, I was so frustrated. I finally got that print done, and I took the 40 other sheets out of the copier and threw them in the garbage. And it hurt me to do that, but I'm just tired of the aggravation. But I hate waste. It just I, I just can't hardly have And I know paper's not terribly expensive. You know, 8 and a half by 11, 20 pounds, just, you're not going to go broke. But I just can't hardly stand it. And so that's why you have double-sided. You need the side that says, John's Pictures of Jesus. That's the side we're going to work from, from John chapter 1 today. And, uh, and if the Lord wills, next week we will look at Paul's pictures of the church. So John's pictures of Jesus this week from John 1, and Paul's pictures of the church from 1 Corinthians 3, Lord willing, next week. And so open your Bibles to John chapter 1. And uh, this is something that, that came into my head years and years ago as I, I was doing some Bible reading and, and, uh, and I actually was talking to uh, the lady that used to cut my hair about it. We were talking about it and, uh, and I, I just said, I said, just, uh, so just go home, with, just go down to the house when you finish cutting my hair if you don't have anybody else. And, and just read John chapter 1 and look at all of the pictures that John paints of Jesus just in the very first chapter of his book, his gospel account. 
And so I wanted to put that in a sermon outline form. And so I want us to think about these this morning. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same, or, uh, uh, he, same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by or through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In other words, everything that was made was made by and through Jesus Christ. So we learn right from these first three verses, three things, or three, one primary thing, then three things within that. But the first thing, by the way, these are all L words for, for our main point, all L words, all right? And by the way, I think I might even put it on my Facebook sign-off last night, so if you read that and you can remember, you, you can get one, two, three, and four down already. Jesus is Lord. We learned that from the first, really from the first verse, but thinking about the first three verses, about Jesus is the Lord. No, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. He was from the beginning. Now, when you see that phrase, the beginning, then as a general rule, your mind needs to go back to Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then you have Matthew 19 and verse 4 where the Pharisees are challenging Jesus, uh, challenging Jesus in regard to uh, uh, marriage and Moses' Moses law on marriage. And he, said, and, and he said, have you not read that he that made them at the beginning? Well, what was he talking about? Genesis 1 and 2. And then in John 8, and this is not on your handout, but in John chapter 8, in about verse 45, somewhere in there, I believe, uh, Jesus talks about the devil. And he says, he's a liar from the beginning. And so when, when you read John 1 and verse 1, say, in the beginning was the word, it's referring back to the time before everything was created. Back to, in, in essence, here's what it is. In the beginning means the beginning of time and matter. There was no matter. In other words, there was no, you know, you know, was it, things that uh, have, have uh, uh, occupy space and have mass. Isn't that the scientific definition? So there was none of that, and there was no time. So in Genesis 1 and verse 1, both, both matter and time begin. And so Jesus preceded that. And note, note also this. And I, I think I might mention this in weeks past, uh, uh, that Jesus was not Jesus until he was brought into the world. He was told, his parents were told to name him Jesus after he was conceived in the womb. And then the name Jesus was given to him when he was born. But he was not Jesus from, from all eternity. He was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And if you go to the last book of our Bibles, to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, you read about this one who's coming, and he says, and his name is the eternal word of God. And so, so Jesus was, was the word. There was the Father and the Word. Now we always we think the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's not the way it was from the beginning. It was the Father, the Word. And the Holy Spirit. And so he was, he is Lord because he was from or prior to the very beginning. But then secondly, under this main point, is that Jesus is God. And I mean, when I say Jesus is God, I mean big G God. Because a lot, or some, some of our religious friends and neighbors have called him a little G God. A God, a little A, then a small, lowercase g God. Jehovah's Witnesses being the primary proponents of that, that error. And sometimes people say, Jesus never claimed to be God. And yet, it wouldn't have mattered if he claimed it or not, because the text says the Word was God. So whether or not Jesus claimed it is not even relevant to the discussion. But, by the way, he did claim it. He said, before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. 
And they knew exactly what he meant by that because they took up stones to kill him. Also, earlier in that same chapter in verse 24, and this is a verse that I talk about or mention a lot in the invitation. Yep. Except you believe, and by the way, I don't know how many of you, usually by the time we get to the invitation, you know, it kind of goes so fast you don't look up the verses because you know that I'm going to spit them out to you. But if you were to go and read in your Bible and to say, except you believe that I am he, but your Bible probably has the word he in italics, which means the word he is not in the original text. So that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said was, except you believe that, what? I am, you shall die in your sins. And then he gets to verse 58, he says, before Abraham was, I am. So he's talking about the fact that he is God. He is, was, is deity. And so he's, he's the Lord because he's from the beginning. He is God. Uh, what did Thomas say in John chapter 20 when, when Jesus showed him his hands and his feet? He said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And by the way, Jesus did not rebuke him for saying that. Jesus is God. And then thirdly under this is that he's the creator. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse matters spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, through whom he what? Made the worlds. The worlds. Not just the world we live in, but everything that's out there. And, and, by the way, did he all watch the launch yesterday? I know Philip did. Philip's up there in the fellowship building helping those ladies. And I'm glad he sent me that reminder text. That was one of the most thrilling things I, I've seen in a long time. To watch that SpaceX launch. You know, and watch a private company send two, send two men into outer space. You know, and, 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 you know, and seeing how fast that thing goes. But then you know, the, view, you know, the view of space from space is infinitely, <laughs> infinitely more beautiful and, and magnificent. And Jesus made all that. He made all that. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, anything that's ever been made was made by Jesus. Now think about, I think about what Colossians 1 and verse 16 says. Not only was it made by him, it was made for him. All things were created by him, whether in heaven or in earth, visible or invisible. All things were made by him and for him. I love that statement. Everything that's made is made to the glory of Jesus Christ and points to Jesus Christ. Now, again, sometimes we think about God the Father, and I'm not, obviously, I would never discount that. As we think about the creation, we think, How great thou art. We sing that great song at the end of our song book. And, you know, we, and we talk about the creation and we think uh, how great thou art. We think about God the Father. Certainly nothing wrong with that. But don't forget Jesus. Don't forget Jesus. Hebrews, Hebrews, Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament show his handiwork. He's, he's from the beginning. He's God. He is the creator. But then number two from our text, go to verse four. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life. There's our second L word. Jesus is the life. He's the source of life. He's the source of eternal life. I know this is one of Big Boy's favorite scriptures, John 5, 39. You search the scriptures for them, you think you have eternal life. But these are they that do testify of me. And then he chased that statement with this one. You would not come to me. Why? What purpose? That you might have life. You would not come to me, he said, that you might have life. Jesus is 
the life. Jesus said of himself in John 10 and verse 10, I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. In John chapter 11, when Jesus was going to visit Lazarus' sisters after he had died, and Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He said, your brother will live again. She said, I understand that he's going to live again in the resurrection. And Jesus answered that. He said, I am the resurrection. What? And the life. I am the resurrection. And the life. John eleven twenty five. John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Paul said of Christ, he says, When Christ our life shall appear. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. In 1 John chapter 1, John spoke about Jesus in this terminology. He said, that life was manifested and witnessed. Because being simply manifested is not sufficient. Because sometimes we don't see what has been manifest. So John wants to make sure that everybody understands. Not only was he here, but we saw him. We saw him. Think about this. If I don't have the life of Christ, all that remains for me is death. If I don't have the life of Christ, all that remains for me is death. And I might even add this. All that remains for me are deaths. Plural. Because I'll die in my physical body. Hebrews 9 to 27. It was appointed unto me that wants to die. And then after this. The judgment. And then what happens at the judgment. Whosoever's name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. Is cast into the lake of fire. Which is the second death. If I do not have the life of Christ. All that remains for me is death. Number three. Same verse, verse four. In him was life, and the life was the, what's our L word there? What is it? Light, that's right. And the life was the light of men. He's the light of the world. In Luke chapter 2, beginning of verse 29 through verse 32, in what I believe is one of the greatest statements made about Jesus given the context, here is little baby Jesus being brought to be presented to the Lord to do all the things for him that his parents were required to do according to the law. And here's this little bitty baby And, um, and Simeon says of him, he will be a light to the Gentiles. Surely Joseph and Mary were not thinking about Gentiles when they brought Jesus to the temple. They said, this little baby, he said, this little baby is going to be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. From the time he came into the world, light was his business. In Matthew 4 and verse 16, speaking about Jesus in a, from, a, from a prophetic standpoint, it says, He came to bring light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. And if memory serves me, that also is a Gentile reference. He came to bring light to those who sat in darkness. 
and in the shadow of death. In John 3 and verse 19, he described himself as an exposing light. An exposing light. Now, I never think about this text or read it hardly without thinking about a story that my dad used to tell about him and my uncle Waif. And there was a, they had a big barn back behind, I believe it was at Uncle Wave's house, and the house he lived in years and years ago. And they kept hogs back there, which meant they kept corn and feed back there, which meant they had what? Rats. Thank you, Johnny. They had rats. And so what would they do for fun? They'd wait till it got dark, go around and surround one half of that barn, and throw the floodlights on, and start hammering away with 22s. Jesus talked about that kind, having his life being that kind of light. In other words, the whole world runs around in darkness doing their, doing their pitiful deeds. He said, but I've come to shine a light on it. I've come to shine. He says, and people who love darkness don't come to the light. You don't shine a light to attract rats, do you? And Jesus said they wouldn't come to the light. Why? Lest their sinful deeds be exposed. So Jesus came not only to bring a light to those who want light, he also came to bring a light to expose the deeds of those who didn't want to do what was right. In John 8 and verse 12, 9 and verse 5, the, probably the most well-known light passage, I am the light of the world. If any man goes with me, he'll not walk in darkness brings us to toward the end of this point if Jesus is not my light all that remains is darkness just like if Jesus is not my, my life all that remains is death if Jesus is not my light all that there is for me is darkness and then I, I threw this in from, from Romans 13 just a passage not about Jesus but about light because, because it just struck me. Listen to what Paul says. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The armor of light. In other words, we can clothe ourselves in light. But it's armor. It's not just to help us see. It's a light that helps protect us. And as we walk in the light, 1 John 1 verse 7, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light of Christ is walking in, really in the armor of light. The armor and the protective power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That brings us to our fourth L word from verse 29. 29 and 37. John points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When John identified Jesus as a lamb, was he identifying him as some meek, feeble, defenseless animal? Is that what, is that, is that what he meant by lamb? You know, because we use that word that way sometimes. March, if it comes in like a lion, it goes out like a lamb. You know, weak or meek, and, you know, not very powerful. That's not what John meant. So when John pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's talking about the Passover lamb. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7. He's talking about Jesus as the sin forgiver. Isaiah 53 and Acts 8 and verse 32. We know that Isaiah is talking about Jesus in, the, in that great messianic chapter. That, that, uh, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the eunuch was reading that text in Acts chapter 8. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept some man help me or guide me? And Philip opened that mouth right at that same verse. 
and preached unto him Jesus. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, whose dumb or silent before his shears, and he opened out his mouth. And talking about that great lamb text from Isaiah 53, Philip opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. The Bible says in the Lamb we have redemption. Redemption. We are bought back by the blood of the Lamb. Ephesians 1 and verse 7 says His, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Peter said it this way, you were not redeemed by silver or gold or by the vain conduct received by the tradition of your fathers. Instead, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. His blood is precious. Then Revelation 5, 1 to 10, and I realize it's imagery, but there's still very clearly stated truth in this text. They had their robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. His blood is powerful. All people, nation, all nations, tribes, people, and tongues are able to have their sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb. If Jesus is not my Lamb, I have no forgiveness of sin. If He is not my Lamb, I have no forgiveness for my sins. The thing about closing out, is Jesus really my Lord? Is he really my Lord? You know, do I, do I, am I willing to obey him without arguing with him? Am I, am I willing to obey him without pausing for a moment and, and pondering whether or not I'm going to pursue whatever course of action he's, he's commanded me to take? In other words, if there's a pause, there's a problem. If there's a discussion or in my mind, there's a problem. If Jesus is my Lord, I'll do whatever he tells me to do, and I'll do it what I know to do. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 22 and following, actually verse 24 specifically. No man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Jesus said in Matthew 12, He who is not with me is against me. And Romans 6 and verse 16 says, Know ye not that you are the servant to him whom you yield yourselves to obey, whether of obedience unto righteousness or sin unto death. There's just two choices. It's light or darkness. It's forgiveness or it's or it's spiritual. It's spiritual death. It's either obedience or it's disobedience. Look, failure to obey is disobedience. I don't have to do what Jesus told me not to do in order to disobey. All I've got to do is not do what He said to do. So it's not a matter of whether or not I'm actively doing things that I know Jesus has told me not to. The question is, am I doing what Jesus has told me to do? Who am I yielding myself to obey? As we conclude, we, say, we ask this question. Someone is my master. Someone is my master. The question is who? question says, who is your master? Who is your master today? If Christ is not your master, all that's left is slavery to sin, the influence of Satan, and spiritual death. Any of that here this morning need to make Jesus their Lord. You do it by obeying Him. Not by saying some little prayer or asking Him into your heart or accepting Him as your personal Savior or whatever number of things that might be told today. You, you make Jesus your Lord by obeying Him. And you obey Him by obeying the Gospel. By believing that He is the Son of God, John 8, 24. That, we, that you'll repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess your faith in Him before men, Matthew 10, 32. And you'll follow Him into death, being buried in the waters of baptism in order to be saved, Mark 16, 15 and 16. 
being washed from every sin in the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 verse 5, and being justified by His grace. Titus 3 and verse 7. May be the case that you made Jesus your Lord at some point in time, but now your allegiances have changed. The Lord's not the Lord is not your Lord. He's still the Lord, but He's not your Lord. First John one verse nine. If we'll con confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you're here and you need to make the Lord make the, the Lord your Lord. Or you need to make him your Lord again. And we want you to come right now. Together we stand and sing this song.